Hello and welcome to Roots and Shoots. We're going to have our second look into the life of David. So turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 16 and we're going to start reading from verse 14. Now the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Saul's attendants said to him, See, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the liar. He will play when the evil spirit from God comes on you, and you will feel better. So Saul said to his attendant, Find someone who plays well and bring him to me. One of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre. He is a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine-looking man, and the Lord is with him. Then Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son David, who is with the sheep. So Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread, a skin of wine, and a young goat, and sent them with his son David to Saul. David came to Saul and entered his service. Saul liked him very much, and David became one of his armour-bearers. Then Saul sent word to Jesse, saying, Allow David to remain in my service, for I am pleased with him. Whenever the Spirit from God came on Saul, David would take up his lyre and play. Then relief would come to Saul. He would feel better, and the evil spirit would leave him. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we're uh, still in the early stages of looking at the life of David. And here we have him as a young man uh, in Saul's service. Lord, we pray that as we study how he lived and how he prioritised and all the ways in which he honoured you, we ask you to open our eyes and our hearts to learn more of how we can be the people that you want us to be. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, this is a very interesting passage. David has been anointed, but we're now in the book of two kings. I know we're reading from Samuel, but now we have King Saul and we have David who has anointed, uh, been anointed to be king. So, we could call this the book of two kings, if you like, because we have the two uh, around at the same time. But when you look at the commentaries, especially the commentaries that focus on David's life, this is a passage that seems to get missed out. And unless you've got a verse by verse commentary, it just skips over this period of David's life. But let me remind you, we looked at some dates last week. David was born in 1040 BC. He was anointed in 1025 BC and he doesn't become king until 1010 BC and although I always get confused with my maths uh, looking at the column on the right there's a 15 year period between David being anointed as king and David actually becoming king what were the challenges that he must have faced in those 15 years what I want us to do is to uh, pause on the passage and I've got some questions for you. I'll just call them up on screen. First of all, have a look and make some notes on what changes in Saul's life. And then, uh, secondly, what is David's most significant attribute in the eyes of the servant? So in verse 18, the servant gives six things that David shows in his life. What's the most significant one of those? And then finally, what challenges did this period of David's life present? So uh, hit the pause button, make some notes and reflect on these questions. And when you're ready, press play and we'll take a look at these together. See you in a moment. Welcome back. So as I said earlier, this passage is omitted by a lot of commentaries. And yet... This is a 15 year period of David's life. So let's have a look, first of all, at what changes 
uh, for Saul. Now you'll notice, I just need to flick back a page here, that in verse 14 it says the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul. When Saul was anointed, uh, and you'll find that earlier in the book of Samuel, it talks about how the Spirit of God came on him with power. And actually, that's a description that's used all through the period of the judges, where uh, as uh, judges are appointed by God, the Spirit comes on them and works through them. Please don't ever think that the Holy Spirit was not at work in the Old Testament. Even though Jesus talks about the Spirit coming, that's the Spirit coming on all believers. But the Holy Spirit was still at work, even from creation where the Spirit of God moved across the face of the waters. But the Spirit came on people like Samson when, uh, you know, in his final day, when he was there between the pillars of the temple, the Spirit enabled him to pull those pillars down and bring about God's judgment. And when Saul is anointed, the Spirit comes on him and he prophesies. But now the Spirit has left him. What that means is that although Saul is still the king, he's no longer equipped to serve as king. Certainly not equipped to serve in the way that God would have him rule. Then it goes on to say an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Now this begs a lot of questions, doesn't it? How can we describe a spirit from God as evil? If you look at the footnote, there's a um, right by the word evil, there's a tiny little A in my edition of the NIV. And if you look at what that refers to down in the footnote, it has an alternative rendering where for evil you could read harmful. So this spirit from God is there really to try and give Saul some kind of discipline. Perhaps... Uh, with a view to turning him back to God or if not at least helping him to understand that he's under judgment because of his disobedience. John Woodhouse says this, evil in this context should not be understood in moral terms but rather as an indication of the misery, distress and harm this spirit caused Saul. So for the word evil don't think of this being a a wicked satanic spirit, but this being a way of God um, niggling away at Saul to say you've left me, you've forsaken me, you're no longer the king that I want you to be. What else changes in Saul's life? I spotted a third thing here, which is really quite sad, uh, as if it wasn't sad enough already. But Saul's attendants, the people around Saul, how do they advise him? They First of all, they recognise, they say, see, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. But what's their advice? Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the liar. He will play when the evil spirit from God comes on you and you will feel better. They're predicting a sedative, something to dull the pain instead of pointing him towards the Lord. Hebrews uh, and chapter 6 and verse 4, I'll just flick over to, to that. It says, It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. To their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Land that drinks in the rain often falling on it and produces a crop useful for the, to those for whom it is farmed receives the blessing of God. But the land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. Now obviously that's a New Testament reading referring to Jesus uh, and those who turn away from Jesus. But here's an example of Saul 
even though he was anointed by God, he is no longer following God and the Holy Spirit has left him. And remember those verses in Peter that uh, you may have joined with us when we were in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. Um, actually, I'm, I'm thinking of 2 Peter where it talks about uh, a dog returning to its vomit. 1 Peter 2.20, it says, If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, and are again entangled in it, and are overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it, and then to turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them the proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit, and a sow that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. You see, what happened to Saul was the Spirit came on him from the outside. What hasn't changed with Saul is his heart. So he's got God's power, God's anointing, and often we find that uh, when we look at the role of the government, God gives government responsibility. But that doesn't mean that the people who enact their responsibility are actually God's people. And in their hearts, uh, their lives are not reflecting the power and the authority that they've been given. With David, uh, his heart was already for the Lord. And if you go back to verse 13, what does it say? From that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. It was from that day onwards. It was an ongoing thing with David. And incidentally, We'll be looking uh, at some future study at the time when David sinned against uh, God and against Bathsheba. And in his psalm of repentance, Psalm 51, he pleads with God in verse 11. He says, take not your Holy Spirit from me. So David senses what happened to Saul. And in his later life, he doesn't want the same thing to happen to him. The, uh, the Reformed doctrine is the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. It's what we um, use in common parlance. We talk about once saved, always saved. And there are some people who disagree with that. And when you look at passages like this, it does make you wonder. We have to ask the question, do we truly know the Lord? Are we changed from within? Because we have the assurance that when we belong to Christ, he will never let us go. Second question was, what is David's most significant attribute in the eyes of the servant? Well, I think it's fairly easy to spot. What have we got here? Um, I've seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem. Number one, he knows how to play the liar. Number two, he's brave man. Number three, he's a warrior. Number four, he speaks well. Number five, he's a fine looking man. Number six, and the Lord is with him. Wouldn't you agree that that's the most important thing? Uh, don't let me uh, decry people with musical gifts. I know Lawrence uh, tunes in and, and bless you, Lawrence. We really appreciate your gifts. But what we appreciate most is your heart for the Lord. And that's what really matters. And other people who don't have musical gifts, you may have other talents, but what matters most is your heart for the Lord. And we thank God for your gifts and for your heart and for the fact that he is there with you. It's interesting that when Saul thinks of David, when uh, Saul sends for David, his thought is, well, he knows he's with the sheep. He knows that David is a shepherd. He's out in the fields. That's what matters to Saul. He wants him to come and be with him. Um, he, David, is still living the life of a shepherd, even though he's been anointed to be king. I suppose, in a way, that's a type of Jesus, isn't it? That uh, he's the good shepherd. He's also the king. So our third question, 
what challenges did, did this period of David's life present? I wonder what you noted down here. Well, the things I noted, first of all, even though he was anointed king, he had to go back to the sheep and he had to trust God. He had to learn patience and obedience. That passage in Hebrews chapter 6 that we looked at, it goes on to say in verse 12. Uh, I missed it here. So Hebrews 6 verse 12. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. And that comes after that warning of those who have gone away from the Lord. It would have been very easy for David to think, well, I'm going to be king and therefore I can sit back and relax and just wait uh, and maybe push to make things happen. But no, he had to go back to the sheep and he had to trust God day by day that what God had promised he would perform. And note that this is not a stoical resignation. This is not David sitting out in the fields, grumbling and fuming and saying, God, when is it going to happen? Why hasn't it happened yet? This is David living by active faith day by day, saying, Lord, I know what's coming, but I want what you've got for me today. And that's what matters. What else uh, are the challenges that this period of David's life presented? Well, the spirit has come powerfully upon him. Try hiding that. So everything now has to reflect the fact that the spirit has come upon him. He has a responsibility to live out uh, the life that God has put in him. David is aware of his anointing, but Saul isn't. And so David is living knowing that he's anointed, but the king who would feel threatened if he knew that, isn't aware of it. And David has the challenge of trusting God, but without alerting Saul, because David didn't want anything to usurp God's timing. Another challenge is, it says distinctly here, Saul liked him very much. Verse 21. The one that David knew had fallen out of favour with God, liked David. That must have been very difficult. Uh, I wonder how much David did try and minister for the Lord to Saul in his times of anxiety, in his times of depression. But what a testimony to David's faithfulness. That he could live a life in the presence of a man who would have considered him his enemy and find that that man loved him. I wonder how many friends uh, do we have? How many people do we have that respect us in our circle of, of acquaintances who love us even though their lifestyle is not one that we would uh, necessarily endorse? But we're willing to show love and humility. And so uh, we earn their respect and we therefore have a platform over which we may over time be able to share the gospel. David was Saul's armour bearer, it says. He became one of his armour bearers. Oh, what could David have done to uh, undermine Saul, to have made him weak in battle? to have caused him to suffer injury or maybe even death. But we'll see throughout David's life, during this period when Saul was also alive, David respects that he is God's anointed king. And even though he's the king in waiting, he does nothing to undermine Saul, even though Saul feels at times that that's what's happening. The last thing that I noticed here is the spirit in David worked through David using his talents to subdue the harmful spirit in Saul. What 
David had been granted in terms of power and the Holy Spirit, David used to help Saul. He didn't let that go to waste. And it, I think this is an interesting picture here. That David's presence and David's music helped Saul even when he was undergoing harm from this adverse spirit that was in him. Isn't that a picture, do you think, of Christian fellowship? That actually one of the real benefits of being part of a church, being part of a body of believers, is that when we are feeling under attack, our brothers and sisters in Christ can lift us up. And it may be in a formal service, so we go along to church on Sunday and we enjoy the singing and our hearts are lifted and our minds are uh, moved from uh, the bad things to thinking about the things of Christ. And that in itself is tremendous. But sometimes it's not in a formal way. Sometimes it's just one to one when we meet together with other Christians. And when we're on a downer, they can share with us and encourage us and help us and build us up in our faith. The power of Christian fellowship. No wonder uh, we're encouraged by the writer to Hebrews not to forsake the meeting of ourselves together. There's real power in fellowship with Christians. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that David, even as a youngster, set such a godly example in the way he deals with your working in his life and the spirit that you have uh, put on him and yet uh, he deals with it with patience and with humility and continues to serve the one who had been anointed king but now the holy spirit had left him lord it's so easy for us to be uh, proud to think that we're better than others to 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 boast in our own gifts and talents and abilities and think that we're better than others. Lord, may we have a heart like David's, that no matter what God has called us to do, our first priority is humbly to serve you and to serve others rather than to push ourselves forward. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for joining in this study. I'll look forward to seeing you next time when we go on and look further into the life of David. In the meantime, have a great week.